Angela and GP Transport Working Group. We are very fortunate to have Jorge Macias from the Environmental Commission for the Central Region of Mexico today to discuss the fuel policies and fleet technology management for Mexico. of our presentation partnership does not force or recommend specific products and services. Information provided in this webinar is if, is if featured on practices, resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar's features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or, or, or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, speakers option in the audio pane. In doing so, we will eliminate the possibility of feedback. If you select an option, a box on the right side will ask you to please mute your audio device while you're not presenting. If you have technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinar help desk. If you would like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type in your question. A video recording and, pre and the presentation will be posted on the LEDGP Transport Working Group page within a few weeks. We have an exciting agenda prepared for you today that is focused on fuels and policies and fleet technology management in Mexico. Um, Jorge Macias, the General Deputy Director for the Environmental Commission for the Central Region of Mexico, will discuss the history, public policies, and challenges that Mexico has faced in terms of private vehicle management. Before our speaker begins his presentation, I will provide short, informative overview of the LEDS Global Partnership Initiative. Following the presentation, we will have a question and answer session, closing remarks, and a survey. The LEDS Global founded in 2000 in cooperation among countries and international programs working to advance low emission climate partnership currently brings together LEDs leaders and practitioners from more than 160 countries and international institutions through innovative peer learning and collaboration forums and networks. The LEDs Global Partnership has three primary goals, strength and quality, supported, coordinated support and leadership of climate resilient low emission development strategies by countries in all regions, foster effective implementation of LEDs, spur development of new LEDs by additional national and subnational governments. The LEDGP offers support through three vibrant regional platforms, the Africa LEDs Partnership, Asia LEDs Partnership, and the Latin America and Caribbean Regional Platform. Each platform defines common country priorities that focus on the LEDs GP efforts on member-driven high-impact needs. Supporting the regional platforms are technical working groups and affiliated programs providing technical support for implementation through four global streams, planning, finance, analysis, and tools. A steering committee provides guidance and said strategic direction, Global Secretariat coordinates LEDGP implementation, knowledge management, and outreach. The LEDGP applies an open and collaborative operating approach members to leverage coordination 
of climate resilient low emission development activities, tools, and resources to achieve common objectives. The LEDs GP is adding value to country led LEDs activities around the world through peer learning and knowledge sharing, technical collaboration, and strengthening understanding and analysis of LEDs benefits. A team of international embark the sustainable program of institute, the U.S. Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and the United Nations Environment Program lead activities under this working group. The LED Training Group provides technical assistance, and transport system strategies, supports low emission development. The working group collaborates with member regional levels. This webinar is the second webinar in a series entitled Supporting Countries with Implementing New Vehicle Emission Fuel Quality Standards. This is brought to you by the LEDs Transport Working Group in partnership with UNEP and Clean Air Asia. So. The present. Jorge? Oh, thanks. Well, um, let me let me start as soon as possible. I have the presentation already. So I'm starting with one. So hi everyone and thanks for the invitation to Embark and all the partnership. Um, what I'm going to try to do in this webinar is to um, show you the roadmap of Mexico City's environmental regulations in somehow 30 years of policies um, and sketch some of the changes that these policies have had in our fleet, in our city, and in our environment. Um, first of all, I would like to start by showing uh, the agenda. I will start speaking about the, um, the context in which Mexico City was involved in 1980s, during the 1980s, and what action plans, what regulations were set in place in the beginning. In the beginning, where when Mexico City was considered one of the most polluted cities in the world, and we were the example of uh, environmental catastrophe. Now, nowadays, it's China probably or you hear those things, but back in the day, it was Mexico City. Then I will uh, explain each and every single one of the policies, starting with the fuel quality standards, which were very important. Inspection maintenance programs, days without a, car, a day without a car program, the air quality monitoring, and some other programs that are equally important. But also, um, as you may imagine, uh, mobility and environmental management is not uh, um, it's not something you have to do, you, you just do for a while and it and it works forever, no? So you have to keep on working, and I will show you that is uh, ever growing challenge for Mexican authorities and for Mexican people. So I will stress what remains to be done some conclusions and hopefully we will have some questions from you so uh, I, I will try to answer them. So the context. Mexico City nowadays is home of 20 million people. Somehow 8 million vehicles are, around in, are in our streets. But during the 80s it was, as I was telling you, one of the most polluted cities in the world. And plenty of factors have barely contributed to this circumstance. In specific, we are in a valley surrounded by mountains. 
uh, in a very high attitude, which is like 2,400 2, meters above sea level. That brings very poor, ven poor ventilation conditions. We're in the, we're a tropical country, or and so we have a lot of radiation, which in turn uh, gives us a lot of problems with ozone. Therefore, we we decided to build our city in one of the worst places. Then, where we have a very accelerated growth in Mexico City, specifically because uh, in the, the society or Mexico's planning uh, was very centralized and all the powers, all the authorities, all the main institutions were, centra were, were placed in Mexico City. So a lot of people from country or from rural areas moved to Mexico City and nowadays it's very populated, as I told you, 20 million people, 20 million people. There's very high motorization growth. In that time, there was high industrialization, and uh, we have a complete lack of a regulatory framework. So this is the context in which the story is set. Um, well, the first thing that started in Mexico City was um, the air quality monitoring. You can't change something you can't measure. So um, the, we started putting stations in the next uh, slide. You can see that um, oh, I can change. Well, it started, I think, with around 25 stations in 19... I can't see the... Yeah. It started with a network of 25 stations. They can measure SO2, CO, NO2, ozone, uh, particular matter, 2.5 and 10 micrometers. And nowadays, there are 46 stations total. Uh, uh, you can see... For, from the mosaic, uh, the mosaic that is in, in your screen, it states every every little square that is in there. It means one day, so you can see how uh, from 1986 to nowadays we've been having a trend of, of cleaning or of diminishing the total concentration of of emissions and. And this is the story, or this is what I want to show you, how we change from this purple picture into a not so, or a yellowish picture nowadays. With this information, and this is very important for you to understand, I will try to stress the importance of uh, citizenship and the, and the um, and the importance of public awareness. The pollution problem was constantly present in social media, especially since we were considered the most polluted city in the world. A lot of, uh, we were in the eyes of the whole world. And it was, but the most important thing, I think, is that it was empirically visible. From the picture, you can see black stuff in the, in the streets. Well, that was a common, common image in our streets. Those black things are birds birds, that whenever we walked in the morning, we will find a lot of killed birds in the streets. So it was empirically visible. We could see that it was a, a health hazard. And it even became a, a, an icon for my whole generation since we lived and saw how pollution had an effect on the death of animals. Uh, so this empirical uh, image generated a unique opportunity for implementing strong regulations and policies. So the government took the opportunity, which was huge, and th there was no way they could look other way. So they had to act. 
And they started with an environmental emergency program or contingency program, which sets in motion temporary restrictive measures for the greatest polluting sectors or sources and also implements policies oriented to inform the general population and reduce personal exposure hazards. Um, this program increased the overall monitoring and inspection of sources, while also it increased the, the pollution costs, not by taxing, but probably, but more because of the actions they had or that industries and the general public had to take in order, in case we had an emergency or a contingency or a pre-contingency. This was very important policy to generate citizenship uh, and public awareness towards environmental emergency. Why is that? The reason behind this is that uh, we, there were uh, announcers all the time in media, all the time in media, telling people what they had to do and also forcing schools, uh, for instance, to leave, to leave kids indoors so kids wouldn't go out and play, so it made a very important statement. Kids actually came back to their homes and they were very aware that they were left without a playground because of their parent actions. So kids became very critical of their parents. So that was very important in terms of communication and in terms of uh, people understanding their rights and their uh, yeah their, 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 their rights and their and what they needed to do uh, in terms of environment so these two graphs show the trend of emissions actually starting from 1989 before it was even bigger but as you can see in terms of uh, particulate matter and also we have been able to diminish by half the total concentration of particles or uh, and of ozone by having four times more population and four times more vehicles in let's say let's say somehow 25 years this is the 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 the, the effect and the and what I want to explain today. As I said, have the population levels with four times more population fleet. Um, since Mexico has a specific circumstance that not every country shares, um, I, I'm, I, I have to explain it to you. So. We, the oil industry and energy industry is state-owned or was state-owned until this year. So the government started by regulating or self-regulating their own industries in terms of oil production and refineries and thermoelectrics. So by starting or in, in the by 1985 and 2000, uh, the two thermoelectrics and the refinery, they used to contribute with 68% um, with, uh, with of the total SO2 emissions. And, well, and the program that, uh, they, that um, or the policies that they started doing was that during winter season, which is uh, where most of uh, pollution or problems with health problems arise, uh, thermoelectric started using CNG. However, for 1998, they quit using heavy oil in one thermoelectric. They completely changed to, to compressed natural gas, and the other thermoelectric was shut down. Um, also, the Azcapotzalco refinery ceased to operate definitely due to the due to the, the, the environmental uh, program and plan. Uh, in terms of, of of contribution, these three sources uh, or the the management of these resources was very important in diminishing 
uh, in a short time emissions and concentrations. And it was not so hard to take these steps because, as I was telling you, these are state-owned. Uh, regarding other fixed sources, the Environmental Contingency or Emergency Program imposed specific working conditions to the urban industry and that increased the polluting costs. So a lot of pollutant in, of, of industries that, pollute, of, that polluted, they decided either to move away from Mexico City or to cease their operation. And nowadays, you can see this transformation from uh, Mexico City that, that was in a great percentage uh, industrial industry, and now is more service oriented. So the environmental the environmental programs contributed in some way to change the economic face of Mexico City. So regarding fuel quality standards, um, well, it's, it's somehow um, an egg or a chicken question, but the thing is that uh, there was regulation that forced vehicles to change their control technology, their control emissions technology, alongside with fuel quality standards. So in 1990, catalytic converters started being introduced, and in 1993, they were forced. The no vehicle that was commercialized or sold in Mexico could not have a catalytic converter. So in 1990, the sulfur level in diesel was diminished and distributed, and also gasoline without lead started being distributed to strategic fleets. It was not generalized, it was just two strategic fleets uh, with, um, with secluded uh, patios. But by 1993, diesel with low sulfur was generally distributed in Mexico City and in the country, in the whole country, by 1997. Uh, lead was completely removed from from fuels in, by 1995. As you can see in the graph, there is a huge uh, slope downwards that almost finished all the, all pollution with lead. So it was controlled by that. It was very easy for the government to take the decision. However, there was a lot of help from uh, foreign uh, financial, foreign banks and, and development banks, uh, which gave Mexico's, Mexico's authorities uh, huge loans so that they could reconvert or convert their, their, their plants or their refinery, refineries. And and that's why they could do it in the short term. By 2006, a federal standard, the NOM 086, was published and establishes the date for introduction of ultra-low sulfur diesel. The goal was the general distribution of ultra-low sulfur diesel in 2010. However, this goal has been revised and changed to 2018. So it hasn't been as easy as as in the past. Um, now, with the introduction of ultra-low sulfur diesel, what has happened is that they, they, they actually, by rule, Pemex, which is a state-owned uh, oil company, was forced to deliver to the whole country by 2010 uh, gasoline with ultra-low sulfur diesel. However, they didn't fulfill this. And since it's a state-owned company, they couldn't actually force themselves to, to do it. And the reason was, or the reason at least that, that, that Pemex says is that they haven't had the money to reconvert all the, all the refineries. Nowadays, they have started to distribute ultra-low sulfur diesel, specifically in the three greatest uh, metropolitan areas of Mexico which is Mexico City, Guadalajara, and Monterrey. But the general goal has been revised and changed to a general distribution in 2018. Uh, as in the former case, uh, uh, control, emission control technologies have 
also being forced to, or how do you say that? Um, the introduction of more strict control technologies has been also elapsed until ultra low sulfur diesel is in the streets. Uh, the importance or the linkage with vehicle emission standards is stressed in this couple of, uh, of slides or graphs. This is a study within um, in the Center for Sustainable Transport, Embark, in World Resources Institute. And what it says is that ultra low sulfur diesel has a, is very important since it can diminish in 45% the total emissions of particulate matter. And furthermore, it can also help you introduce diesel particulate filters, which are very relevant in the total control of particulate matter in because it diminishes it in around 90%. So we have been struggling in the last years to uh, make our emission standards more strict because we have the excuse from we have the, the the automotive industry has the reason which can be arguable that since there is no ultra low sulfur laser that they cannot import or build better technologies which is arguable because 99% of our of our private vehicle fleet is based on gasoline and not on diesel. So after having the the emergency plan and also changing and all these policies with the industry and having an air quality monitoring um, Mexico City started with a program which is very controversial, not only in Mexico but in other parts in the world, which is a day without a car. And how it works is that, or how it, how it used to work in the beginning was that every single vehicle couldn't uh, was forbidden to to be driven or to to circulate one day, one weekday. So if you're plague or if you're Yes, if your license plate ended in 5 and 6, you would not uh, drive on Mondays, 7 and 8, which is a pink thing here. You wouldn't drive on Tuesdays, 3 and 4, Wednesday, and so on. So every day, they, they, they thought that they would have a 20% diminishment in vehicle intensity use. However, this was not like that. Because in the beginning, people started buying, not everyone, but some people started a different car, one that could be driven on Monday and another that was being, could be driven on Tuesday. So it had an initial effect of um, promoting a higher motorization that before that else they would have. However, by 1998 they, and 1996, the fleet growth effect was diminished by the introduction of positive incentives in 1996 and 1998. The positive incentives was as follows. If you were a clean vehicle or you had a clean vehicle, you could drive every day. So that solely changed a lot of things because people would now the decision of the of the population was I buy a new car, I buy another car or can I change my car for a newer or a cleaner vehicle. So for some of them it was cleaner or easier to buy a cleaner vehicle. Therefore it had an important influence on total fleet renewal and on changing the face of the fleet in Mexico City. That's why according to Molina Center, the day with a car have, has had an influence on average fleet age. Mexico City fleet is four years younger than comparable cities such as Guadalajara and Monterrey. 
um, this is very this is a lot of uh, this is a huge impact in renewable private vehicle fleet will be greater in 70 percent for volatile uh, volatile organic compounds 35 percent of net oxide nit nitrogen oxides and 27 percent in, partic in particulate matter Nonetheless, as I told you, they recognize an effect on total fleet growth, which was 2.9 less vehicles that they would otherwise have. Sorry. Vehicles greater than 15 year, and, and this, these graphs are only to show the impact of this four year difference. So vehicles greater than 15 years old in Mexico, this is uh, Six million vehicles or six million data measured uh, in each car. Uh, vehicles 15 years old contribute with six times more hydrocarbons and 10 times more noxes per kilometer. So renewable was very important for us in the beginning. Specifically, because we needed to to push all the vehicles that did not have a catalytic converter. And as you can see, the, the gray area is a percentage or is a number of vehicles without a catalytic converter. And as you can see, as time passed, uh, Mexico, was, Mexico City was able to promote and to push vehicles that did not have catalytic converter out of the city. Uh, the effect of renewal can be very well seen in this graph. Baja California is an entity in the northern part of Mexico. We can see the national average in the uh -oh, sorry in the in the middle. You can see the national average. So around 25% of the vehicles in the whole country are older than 20 years, 20 plus years. Well, in Baja California is 82%. In the metropolitan zone of Mexico City, which is the central region, is only around 14%. And this is this was or this has been a very important effect of all the policies. There was also a special fleet management or special programs for for fleets. If some of you have seen Mexico City's um, pictures back in 1980s and 1990s. You would remember a lot of beetles, a lot of green beetles. This was the face of Mexico City. There were around 50,000 regular taxi beetles in Mexico City, but almost twice as much if you consider non-regulated or pirate, pirate taxis, non-regulated taxis, and. Um, in the beginning, there, there were a great option, but after a while, since they didn't have a catalytic converter, uh, Mexico City has had to start a strategy for phasing out beetles, which lacked emissions control technology. Um, the strategy was comprised by differential rates. Uh, I mean, uh, they allowed beetles to, or they allowed other uh, owners of taxis that had other vehicles, more environmental, sound, more environmental sound vehicles, they were allowed to charge a little bit more for a trip in taxi. So that's what I mean by a differential rate. Also, the day without a car restriction started uh, applying to taxis. So this diminished the time in which taxis or vehicles could drive and it uh, completely have an effect on their income. So this strategy was uh, for a long time, it was like around for 10 years, until uh, the government completely decided to cease all concessions to these type of vehicles uh, around in 2010, I think, uh, 2006, sorry. And, and this helped changing Mexico City's face. Um, this was very important, Th this program was very important since the taxis, um, they 
they drive or they, they, they have a, an intensity of use of five times uh, more than a private vehicle or of a private vehicle and um, therefore we're speaking about 100,000 regular taxi vehicles which is a lot of impact, they had a lot of impact. Okay, so um, so moving forward, uh, I will ask you if you can see any. I think we had also inspection maintenance, but I, I, I think sorry, I have to come back. Also, um, sorry, I, I have to come back. I forgot to speak about the program of inspection maintenance. Um, the inspection and maintenance program was started also in 1990 and the aim was to uh, check the, the environmental performance of every single vehicle that is driven in Mexico City. Um, this program, uh, what it does is that it works along with the day without a car the day without a car program. Therefore, if you have an environmental performance or, or you are from the cleanest 10% uh, of, the, of the fleet, you can access to the uh, to a waiver on the restriction or on the circulation restrictions of the day without a car program. Also, if you are, or on the on the other side, if you are from the most polluted percentile, then you will not only not drive one day, but you won't be able to circulate two days. And the the rules have changed in the past past month or past year, but but in essence, what it aim or the aim is to go and check your engine or check your car in uh, licensed workshops with um, with licensed workshops which they will give you um, a sticker and that will tell the policemen in the streets whether you are allowed to circulate or not, to drive or not. Um, this program uh, nowadays is trying to be improved uh, and that's one of the main projects that we have in the Commission is try to make or to harmonize the inspection and maintenance program across the whole six states that conform the Mexico City megalopolis which is six states in the central region of Mexico and so this inspection and maintenance program is being grown So these are the main the main strategies that were taken by Mexico City. Um, but nowadays you can still see these images in Mexico. So I will dare you to tell the difference between one and the other picture in these two slides. Apparently there's a whole of differences. So you would imagine that in Denmark and in Holland or in Netherlands they will have a higher motorization that we do have nowadays. So with everything that I stated still these are the image of Mexico City nowadays. So we have a still a long time or a long um, road to follow so that we can change into Copenhagen and to Amsterdam. But Coming back to the pictures, if you would imagine the motorization rate in Mexico City compared to Copenhagen, you wouldn't believe that Mexico City have, or Mexico as a country, in 2005 we used to have 142 cars per thousand vehicle, per, 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 per a thousand people, and that Netherlands has half three times more than us and also Germany has 
546. So you would imagine for the picture from the pictures that motorization in Mexico is not as much as compared to the to the iconic pictures that we have in Amsterdam or in Denmark. Denmark, for instance, is here, 360, so it's twelve, more than twice the, the motorization rate. Um, nowadays, Mexico has changed. Now we are around 280, which in five years is a lot. I will show you why is that. We have a very high motorization rate, more than a lot of people, more than a lot of countries. And I will go in detail. Great. So now trying to to go into what can we do or what shall we do in the future in term in general terms. So a vehicle fleet management strategy has to understand that a vehicle follows during its lifetime, we have to be aware of policies at the entrance, policies when they are used, and policies to increase their mortality. So it's like, I see it as if they were humans or citizens. You have to care how are they how are they born, how they grow, and how they die. So it's the same with cars. And in Mexico, in the entrance, we have to be very aware of imported second-hand vehicles. We have to be very aware also of new vehicles. So the new entrants in the fleet for Mexico are imported second-hand vehicles and new vehicles. For these cars, and also in terms, these cars, they become, after first year, now they are the national use vehicle fleet. So in the entrance, we have to focus on important second-hand vehicles and new vehicles, and follow their life through use and mortality. Now, uh, I, I will be back to that graph, but first I, will, I want to speak about uh, a problem that I think may be interesting for you in Asia. In Ported second-hand vehicles in Mexico has been a huge problem. The reason behind that is that they are big, they have a huge volume, they have a huge motorization. 69% of vehicles that we import from the United States are vans, minivans, pickups, and SUVs. Of course, this whole problem comes because we are neighbors with the United States, so we are the, the highest motorized, motorized country in the world. So we have access to very, very cheap vehicles. But they are cheap because they can't use them anymore in the United States because they, they don't have catalytic converter, they don't have anything. And so this has become a huge problem to other cities. Not Mexico City though, because in Mexico City, since we have a lot of policies, all these vehicles, they don't come as much as in the northern part. This is the reason in the graph I showed you about Baja California, that Baja California has 80% of their fleet older than 20 years old. Well, in Mexico City, this is just only 40%, 14%. And the miles, they are huge. Uh, some studies from Centro Mario Molina show that they emit twice as much in noxes, hydrocarbons, and 61% in, in carbon monoxide compared to vehicles with the same conditions or, or the same vehicle in Mexico City during 2005. So this is a huge problem. And as I will show you, this is getting global. It is not only in Mexico. A study we did also in WRI when I was part of WRI. I had the fortune to be part of, of WRI. Um, stated that the global flow of vehicles, of imported second-hand vehicles in 1997 was only of 1,200,000 vehicles, which mainly came from Germany and went to Europe. So it was mainly local and Japan. United States only imported 175,000 vehicles. And they didn't come to Mexico since it was prohibited. We only imported 6,000 vehicles. However, 10 years later, 
in 2006, uh, the number of vehicles imported by the United States was 2 million vehicles. And we alone, in one year, one year, this is only one year, we imported half a million vehicles from the United States. And this is, or these are, one and a half million vehicles that emit twice as much as a used vehicle in Mexico and that have a motor, uh, very high motor, uh, volume in their motor. But what, what I find, find important or interesting for you is to see that we have new, in, in the yellow arrows, that we have new actors coming into play in the global, global agenda, which, is, which are China and India. And they, have, they are starting to input vehicles because, and this is very important, because they have set environmental regulation policies for their vehicles. So they're expelling the most polluting vehicles. And they will expel them to whoever does not have environmental controls. So for me, it was very important to show you this study and to show you this, this graph so that you can s start working in policies or in regulation to, to not be Mexico. Uh, we have now, as I showed you, we, have, we used to have 150 vehicles per thousand. Nowadays, it's almost 300. We have 30 million vehicles in whole Mexico, in, in whole Mexico which is almost as much as the whole Venezuela population and we have a Venezuela population of vehicles in Mexico that we have to care about. Uh, also, it's very important to show you that there has been a lot of things uh, going on uh, trying to, to stop uh, illegal uh, imported second imported secondhand vehicles. In, in just uh, four years, we have imported around four and a half million vehicles from this nature and we have set in place a lot of legal measures but uh, I have to be very honest uh, there's a lot of corruption and a lot of legal loopholes were found and a lot of well while we try to cease the importation of these vehicles, a lot of loopholes, regular loopholes, were used to take advantage and they started growing. Now, once again, that's why this green, the green line means is vehicles imported through legal uh, loopholes. Okay, so in terms of entrance, what policies or in general policies shall focus is to ensure the, the proper entrance conditions in terms of physical and mechanical but also in terms of control emission, emission control. Um, in terms of use, we have to foster a maintenance culture and a rational vehicle use. Uh, the, the implementation of compulsory inspection and maintenance program is very important. Uh, specifically, if uh, specifically important, since to to be compulsory and to be monitored in on streets. Also, well, fuel taxes is very important for use, and fuel quality standards. In terms of mortality, uh, there is a need to promote fleet renewal and emission control technologies through. Uh, policies like low emission zones, parking policies, retirement systems. We have to think in terms that vehicles are like population, are, are like people. So while we think in pension funds for people, we are not thinking in pension funds for vehicle retirement. And I think that we have to evolve into a self-sustainable pension fund for vehicles so that we can increase mortality. 
Scrapping programs are very are, are limited by the resources that you have at stake. But through a self-sustainable retirement system, you could do that. Also, and all very important to promote mobility. Um, as you may be already, or you may already be listening to from previous talk. Mobility is very important. But well, going back to 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 the conclusions, we have to start thinking not in terms of concentration, but in terms of personal exposure. Well, it is very important to have very small concentration levels, also high emitters, or in one minute you can have an exposure of a whole day if you are faced with an image like the one that I'm showing you. So it is very important to have policies that regulate the on-street peaks for that increased personal exposure to people. Uh, in this regard, we are working in a policy called low emission zones, which have a categorization just as as in Europe. You can you here you can see the stickers that are green, white, yellow, and red. Green being the cleanest vehicle, uh, yellow being the, the middle, and red uh, being the most polluting vehicles. So how low emission zones work is that instead of uh, having a program like a day without a car that restricts vehicles by not being able to circulate or to being driven for a day, what happens then is that you will not be able to drive or circulate in a place, in a territory. And this is very important because you will never be able to drive in that place. Therefore, even if you buy another car, you won't be able to be in that area unless you buy a, a, a better or less polluting car. So no, bound, no rebound effect on motorization rate is, 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 um, is generated. And this, this policy has had a lot of good effect in a lot of countries. There are 240 cities in the world that have low emission zones put in place. And they have very important effects. For instance, you can see uh, Stockholm, which is where low emission zones started, and they had an effect of 60% less concentration of Mat particulate matter, and also Berlin had an effect of 50% particulate matter. You can see it here. You can't see it here, but I can show you well. I will show you the the the, the, the case of Berlin. So uh, this is the case of Berlin. Berlin. Uh, the graph what it shows is a is a is a characterization of fleet. So for instance, in terms of diesel cars, 34% were green, 36% were yellow, and 24% were red, were polluting. And in 2010, this was the trend. They, 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 they expected the fleet to be 49% green, 29% yellow, and 18% red. However, once the low emission zone was in place, the effect was as follows. 91% of the vehicle, the whole fleet, turned into green. 7% yellow and only 2% red. And this is an impressive effect of changing the whole fleet composition, the whole fleet technology, by in only three years. And obviously, they open the opportunity to change your catalytic converter, to, to convert the motor, to, 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 to have changes in your car that will not drive you into buying a new car. But, well, this, this policy is very important. And by 2013, traffic-related total carbon concentration in Berlin has decreased by 
in 2011 and 53% in 2014. This impact in terms of air quality and climate change has been very relevant. Um, closing, the, we also have to work on urban planning. This is, this is an image from Mexico and this is how we are building our cities nowadays. And we're promoting urban sprawl, we're promoting longer trips, we're promoting uh, social, um, social separation. We're promoting a lot of things by how we plan our cities. And this is very relevant and I didn't want to finish the presentation without stating it. Obviously, we have to improve mobility. Uh, mobility not only has to do with, with environment but also with quality of life. The average trip in Mexico City is two hours. Yeah, the average commute from people in Mexico City is two hours a day which in, the, in their whole lifetime will amount for total five years in which you will be in traffic. So just think what you would do in five years of your, if you, if you, would given, you were given five years more of your life, you would be able to study two more degrees or I don't know, you can do whatever you want with those five years, but we need to give back life to the people. And lastly, and just to conclude, Yes, this image. And most of you are in the government, some of you are in NGOs, and well, things are easier uh, whenever we speak about mobility, whenever we speak about um, things that are not controversial. And they are very important, as I said, but doing mobility without transport demand management, without really tackling the pink elephant in the room, which is cars, is like exercising without a diet. Obviously, you can, you can probably overcome the calories that you're eating while you're having exercise, but it will take you a lot more time to arrive to the place you want to go. So, um, I think the integral approach or the integrated approach shall be have transport demand management and mobility together to have exercise but also diet. And diet is not always, obviously no one wants to do diet but sometimes it's the only way to go. And I think that's the whole presentation from my side so in case you have any question I'm more than willing to answer them. Thank you so much, Jorge, for your very informative um, presentation. Um, let me, so we're going to change the presenter back to me. Um, one second. Okay, great. Um, so we want to get ready for some questions um, from the audience. Oops, sorry. Let me pull that up. Um, so the first question we have is, in the case of Mexico, what were the lessons learned when they fully implemented cleaner fuels, such as the Euro 4 fuels? Um, and what type of outreach, who was involved uh, in the process? Okay, um, as I said, um, in terms of outreach, uh, it was very easy since uh, private, uh, private entities were not involved in, 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 in the development or in the, in the industrialization of oil. Uh, the oil industry is mainly state-owned or was state-owned, therefore no, nothing there was no major discussion and however as I said it's also very it's very 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 important for new technologies to be in place. Mm. 
the Euro 4, Euro 4 uh, technologies, most of them have these particular filters. And mainly the passive, the passive filters, they will require that you have ultra low sulfur diesel. There are some others somehow that have uh, that are active, active uh, diesel particular filters, active regeneration diesel particular filters, and they do not require the to have ultra low sulfur diesel. Therefore, sometimes there are there are technologies that you can access without actually changing fuel, but it certainly makes it easier if you have ultra low sulfur diesel. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so another question from the audience that we have is that um, an audience member recognized that the um, ozone and PM10 concentrations are still very high on one of your slides, and they would like to hear what further Oh, man. Angela? Uh huh. So, sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Did you hear the question? I didn't. I couldn't hear you. The, um, that, oh, okay, sorry. So that the ozone and the PM10 concentrations were still high. Um, so. In the future, what else does Mexico have planned in order to reduce emissions, improve air quality? Yeah, they're still very high. So, work is being doing is being done or has been done in in increasing um, public transport in transport uh, in public in, in massive public transport. That has been increased. Now there are 300 kilometers of BRT systems. They change. They they have promoted the bike uh, bike uh, public bike system, which is very very successful. And they're increasing that program. This it it is also very it's, it's a very successful case, since you wouldn't imagine that in Mexico City anyone would use. A vehicle, a uh, bicycle. Sorry, and nowadays it's it's very successful. So those two programs are in place. However, we are also uh, trying to uh, change. Now the challenge is to change the 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 public transport that is not in in, in corridors, but in the feeders, because they are they represent. 50% uh, of the trips, the whole trips, and they are very old. The the buses that we have, they are, they have at least 25 years, and and so what the government of Mexico City is trying to do is trying to to push all those 30,000 micro buses out of the streets in the near future. So that's that's a very important policy that they're pushing now. Um, in terms of uh, uh, private vehicle ownership of pri private vehicles, sorry, uh, the inspection and maintenance program is being improved. We're trying to change, or we're going to ch we're going to change the emission factor, the emission limits for the whole fleet uh, by by a by a lot, um, 80 percent, probably around. We're speaking about 50 percent of uh, diminishing the, the limits of the vehicles that are going to be able to drive every day. So that's also being done. And I think th those are the main policies. We're also um, we're also reviewing the emergency program to change it. So, but th those are the main policies that are in place right now. Great, thank you, Jorge. So, I'm going to take um, I'm going to take two more questions from the audience. But if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to continue asking them, um, and we can answer them offline. Um, you can also email us. Um, us 
give an email address at the end of the presentation. So the next question is, um, which particular strategy in addressing public resistance, if any, um, in moving toward change proved best in the case of Mexico? So in terms of implementing new policies in order to um, improve the air quality, um, improve the gas, uh, uh -huh. the diesel, diesel quality, things like that. The best, part, the, the best communication strategy was to see the dead birds in the streets. I mean, that was very, you could leave it, like you, you could see that there was a huge hazard or environmental hazard and that you were exposing, exposing your kids to that. Therefore, the government had to do very little communication in terms of convincing people that there were things that, sh that should be done. And, and, and well, in, given that, that there was no impact in the price of fuel, very little was had, had to be done to convince people that that was a good measure. Since people didn't, sh didn't suffer any change in, in prices uh, since they were state-owned and they had total control of prices, when they changed the quality of fuel, there was no impact in population. So there was very little they needed to do for, for, for changing fuels in terms of communication to the, or outreach to people. To the general population. Great, thank you. And so the final question is, what are the standards of sulfur quality and diesel in order to have less emission? Um, um, what, what, the standard is 15 parts per million, I think. 15 parts per million. Now that what, what they're trying to request to ask for uh, in general, but this is only something that is being uh, achieved in the three major metropolitan zones in Mexico, not in the whole country. And that's a very important policy that we have to change to, to get ultra low sulfur diesel in the whole country. Because we cannot discriminate between a, a truck that comes from another entity and comes to Mexico City with uh, not ultra low sulfur diesel. Great. So thank you, Jorge, for answering the questions. Um, we need to move forward as we're we're a little over, but uh, um, so the next steps is now we'd like to ask our audience to take a minute to answer a quick survey on the web webinar you view today. We have three short questions for, your answer, uh, for you to answer. Um, your feedback is very important to us as it allows us to know what we are doing well and where we can improve. So, Yeah. 
Thank you for answering our survey. On behalf of the Let Go Partnership and the Transport Working Group, I'd like to thank all of you who attended for participating in today's webinars. Um, I invite you to check the LEDGP website over the next few weeks if you would like to view the slides and listen to the recording for today's presentation. Um, also, would like to note that we will be having another webinar um, on January 28th. So please come back and check out for more information on that. Have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again um, at future LEDS events. This concludes our webinar. Thank you.